Welcome to the second Mittermeier, Karl Mittermeier Symposium on the History and Philosophy of Economics. Today is um, the 15th of August, 2022. I will be here today and tomorrow. Um, we are at the Johannesburg Country Club in Johannesburg. Um, this event is hosted by the Karl Mittermeier Center for Philosophy of, uh, Philosophy of Economics and the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Studies. Correction, Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study um, at the University of Johannesburg. You know, over the last few days, I've been stressing so many times, like, what do I need to do still, and what can I do to make it better? Like the name tags, and making sure we get started on time, and worrying about A, B, all the way to Z. But then, every time I started worrying, I thought, it's not me that's doing this. This conference is done and made, and it will be what it is by virtue of these incredible people who will be talking today. And so there's no need to worry because it all depends on the other people. And the amazing thing is that we really have amazing people here. Um, what I will do also for the sake of, of the recording, I'm just gonna go through the list of speakers, um, and then you get an idea what incredible speakers we have here, and that it's none of, it's not about me trying to do something better anyway. So, um, and I'm going to, I'm going according to the program. Um, we've got Samantha Ashman from the University of Johannesburg. We've got Prof. Rod O'Donnell from the University of Sydney. We have Angela Biden from the University of Johannesburg. We have Chad Harris from the University of Johannesburg. We have Prof. Peter Bauer from the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Kenneth Kramer from the University of the Witwatersrand. Professor Alan Kierman from Mas University of Marseille. Ecole des études haute études des sciences sociales. My, my wife is French. She'd be laughing now. So <laughs> please, you're welcome to laugh. Um, we will later, um, before lunch, have the Vice Chancellor of the University of Witwatersrand give a welcome address. Um, University of Johannesburg, thank you very much, very clear. Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, Professor Chilitsi Mawala, will be giving a welcome just before lunch, introduced by Dr. Bangani Nkulunga. We've got Dr. John Hart here from UNISA, Pretoria. Dr. Melissa Vergara Fernandez from Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Dr. Nobantum Beki, University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. Professor Amos Wittstum from the London School of Economics. Professor Gianpaolo Gazzarelli from the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. And from La Sapienza in Italy, Rome. Prof. Alain Marciano from the University of Montpellier. Professor uh, Bill Taller from um, ex Virginia, George Mason University at Virginia, a businessman now. If, if you ask him what business he's in, um, you're going to be so amazed. You, you're not going to listen to the conference anymore, so hold back, please. <laughs> Professor Andreas Freitag from Friedrich Schiller Uni Universität in Jena. That was much easier than the French part. Dr. Jerome Lange from the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. Dr. Uh, Professor Pascal Bridel from Lausanne University. 
Prof. UK from the University of Johannesburg, yours truly. Um, Dr. Lyndall Keaton from the University of the Witwatersrand. Doc, Doc, Professor Niels Goldschmidt from the University of Siegen and Dr. Fisea Moreda from Addis Ababa University. Um, well, lots of names. Um, the title, you know, the theme of this conference, it's the, it says finding better ways of doing economics. It's not meant to be in any way arrogant and thinking and saying that we are finding, we are coming up with the new economics. Instead, it's coming from a place of humility. It was, it, it's something I've taken from Karl Mittermeier's writings where he says that the way that economics is going, it is, it's using its tools and it's pretending as if there are no economic problems left. We can now go to other social sciences and apply those tools. It's commonly known as the imperialism of economics. Um, and so economists look at the law, they look at politics, they look at religion even, um, utilizing the tools of economics. And Karl Mittermeier's thought was always, well, we've got to do some introspection first and find out if there aren't better ways of dealing with our economic problems, better ways of understanding economics. So it's coming from that perspective, from, from, from that perspective of humility of economics rather than the arrogance and just going out and applying it to other areas. And the themes, and I'm taking the prerogative because I'm inviting everybody and because it's a Karl Mittermeier Center, that the theme, that, 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 that the topics within those themes are aligned to the ideas, the thinking of Karl Mittermeier. Um, so it is questions relating to market order um, the working of a market economy, questions relating to the philosophy of economics, its methodology, and the history of economics. Um, peop his history of economics isn't just history, it is economics. Um, Adam Smith is economics. <laughs> so this, this will be the themes that will be addressed um, in various ways today, and I've talked far too long already. Um, and what, in, in terms of um, if order, if you need Wi-Fi, it's, it's open Wi-Fi. Um, you, there you see it's um, the country club's Wi-Fi. Um, we will have, you know, according to the program, you will see that um, the first speaker, Professor Rod O'Donnell, has got 40 minutes, but he'll probably talk for 30 minutes, and we leave 10 minutes for discussion. Um, and we will have a chair who will field questions after the talk, or during the talk, however the presenter wants it. And our first chair um, this morning is Sam Ashman. Thank you very much. Uh, quick good morning from me. Um, uh, just to, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Sam Ashman. I'm based in the School of Economics here at the University of Johannesburg. I work, broadly speaking, on the political economy of South Africa from a heterodox perspective. So I'm, I'm quite honoured to be here in that I don't really work directly on the history or the philosophy of economics, but I try and retain it. I, well, I do retain an interest in it. Um, and I am constantly appalled by how little history of the, their own discipline that uh, e economists and economic students know. Um, but don't let me get started. Um, so I, I'm, I will be a, I'm an amiable chair, generally speaking. <laughs> um, but let me um, in introduce, I'll, I'll go through the first three, I'll, go, I'll introduce the three speakers, 
and then it'll be, it's pres like, as Michael said, it's presentation questions, presentation questions, presentation questions. So firstly, we've, we've got Prof, Prof Rod O'Donnell, who I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're all delighted has, has come all the way from Sydney, um, probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but uh, you know, has written wonderfully and very widely, on, particularly on Keynes. Um, so it's, it's excellent to be able to welcome him here. And then we've got two of my colleagues from UJ. Firstly, Angela uh, Biden from the philosophy department. Um, she's working on solving the choice determinism dilemma, a summary of Mittelmeier's dot, dot, dot. <laughs> now, the dot, dot, dot is new text, because I understand that the, the precise title of the new text hasn't yet been determined. So hence the mysterious dot, dot, dot. Um, and then followed by Chad Harris, who's also in our philosophy department, who's going to be talking on facts, um, institutional and other. Uh, so Rod, Rod is going first on improving economics with better forms of reasoning. Now, um, to take the load off Michael, um, I've got another little job to do. I'm sorry for taking up a little bit more of your time, but we're here today to celebrate the life, thought, and contributions of a remarkable man who enjoyed success in some aspects of his life and uh, lack of success in other areas. Fortunately, although Carl is no longer with us, we are now able to put things to rights and get his contributions out to the rest of the world um, for the benefit of the rest of the world. The people who've made that possible, very briefly, I would like to thank uh, from all of us collectively. First of all, firstly, the uh, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. Um, secondly, Dr. Bongani Nguyen-Kulungu, the Director of JIAS, the Dean of Humanities at uh, the University of Johannesburg, Professor Camilla Naidu. Next, and perhaps most important of all, is the indefatigable Isabella Mittermeier and Michael Stettler, who has, was one of Carl's students and has also been uh, instrumental. And finally, I would like to thank Paul Stevens, who is making the dissemination of Carl's ideas possible through Bristol University Press. Okay, let me um, now move on to what I would like to say. Um, and I want to begin with a question, which the relevance of which will become clearer later. This is the question. Given that human-induced climate change is real, what is the probability of its significant reduction by 2032? That's to say in 10 years' time. And we'll call significant greater than equal or equal to one third. So don't delay on it. Just pick a rough probability, remember it, and don't change it, please. OK, let's move on. Now, there are only two approaches to improving something. We can keep the original and try and modify it to make it better. Or the alternative is to replace it, throw it out, and get something better and, uh, instead. Carl's choice was the second. Um, but let me just, a little bit of history. The, first is, the second dissertation, 87, we all know about because it's been published. Um, and that was successful, and it was on a quite specific topic. And that was all to do with Adam Smith. But I want to raise the question of why did Carl have to have a second attempt for his PhD? Oh, this is not quick. OK, so his first dissertation, which is what we're going to talk about today, I'm running with the title The Analytical Philosophy of uh, Economics, and this is a deep, wide-ranging and subtle work. It, I, it took me several readings to finally get to the bottom of it and figure out all the different pieces and put them together um, in one whole. Um, 
And what it did was propose a reconceptualization of the foundations of mainstream economic, uh, oh, sorry. Was I not clear? But you were clear. Thank you. All right, thanks. So this is a reconceptualization project that he's undertaken, and it was never examined, and it, I think this explains why he, his, he chose the strategy of doing his second dissertation on a much narrower, more specific topic that was more familiar to the world rather than trying to do too much with the first. Okay, so what's the goal of the uh, first dissertation? It's to change the conceptual framework, to replace neoclassical economics with a better uh, framework, one that had empirical content. Carl claimed that there was next to no empirical content in neoclassical economics, and that was the, the big mistake. So we're going to replace one with, with the other. And this is going to be a reality-based analysis. So four core principles are being used to put together the new program or the new framework, but the guiding principle throughout is realism, not idealism. So the first core, there are four core elements. The first one is facts. And here he distinguishes between two different kinds of facts, which at first was a little bit confusing, but this is, uh, it's now clearer to me. Ex post facts are obviously what happens after uh, some point in time. And they have causes and make that X kind of statements about the event or the effect of the causes. Ex ante facts, which are the, the ones that are a little bit more difficult to get your head around, they exist before ex post facts and they're the causes, either the sole cause or the primary cause of the ex post facts. So ex, ex ante facts are causes in effect. Um, and they lead to why X statements. They explain why the ex post facts happened. All right, let's have a look at the, the uh, definition. Ex ante facts, it's only about 30 pages into the book that Carl finally defines them in a clear way. And that definition is that they are the structural enduring facts of the actual economy that cause its outcomes. So they will be things like institutions, the agents in different roles in those institutions, objectives of agents, and then agent capacities. Then we move on to how do we determine those you observe reality and uh, draw inferences from that. And you use the, uh, the identities or similarities between things to create generalized facts, which are going to then be your ex ante facts. And that leads uh, pretty clearly to our next core element, which is induction. So the philosophy comes in here. In science, induction deals with facts from start to finish. If reality changes, the facts change. So we've got new ex ante facts, we're going to have new axioms and therefore new theories. The implication is that we're never going to be locked into a universal theory covering all possible situations forever until doomsday. Theories, facts change, therefore the theories change. Now, the question will come up, is induction justified or not? And this goes back to David Hume, who, like many other people, thought induction was useful. He was not sceptical about the usefulness of, of induction, but he was completely sceptical skeptical about justifying it, where justifica justification meant deductive justification. And most people will agree that's off the table. You cannot justify deductively justify it, which has uh, generated a huge literature, one key strand of which says, OK, we can't do it deductively. Let's do it in a non-deductive way. And the con contributors there are the following. I'm not going to go th into them. I just want to show you that this, this line of thinking has been around for quite some time. Um, 
But Karl's implied position, he didn't explore this, but his implied position was it is necessary and justifiable if we want to have uh, reality-based social science. Uh, this is not moving on quickly. Okay, so the steps in Karl's scientific theory theorising are going to be use uh, observe reality, use induction to create the ex ante facts, then out of those create rea reality-based axioms, and they're not going to be imagination-based based, uh, axioms. Construct theories from those axioms using deduction, and obviously we are using both induction first, then deduction in creating theories. We're not just starting with some imaginary ideas and then using deduction. And mathematics will come in when appropriate. It won't be there all the time necessarily. So the two tasks of theory in Carl's story are first, explanation of events. That's easy. Once you've got your theory, you can then explain. Uh, and if you have problems, then you need a, a better theory. Second task is prediction of events, and this is much harder, but it's unavoidable because we all need guides to the future in order to make decisions in the present, especially in economics. Um, and Carl's strong point was you must not confuse these two kinds of facts because that was a big mistake, and it was a mistake made by um, orthodox theory. In Karl's story, orthodoxy equated them so that whatever was, uh, well, let me make it continue. What equating them does is makes prediction and explanation identical activities but in reverse directions. So analytically they're the same. Temporally, uh, prediction looks forward into the future explanation looks back and explains what happens in the past. Uh, and orthodoxy also assumes determinism here in that the ex, its ex ante facts in the theory determine the ex post facts in reality. So if your theory starts out saying agents seek optimal outcomes, that's the ex ante fact. The ex post fact is identical in, in this sense, that they will get, they will achieve or acquire optimality. They don't fail ever in, in their attempt. So the ex ante fact then becomes equivalent to the ex post fact. I'm trying to make this move on a bit more quickly, but it's not running. Now, a subsidiary com uh, distinction comes in here when it, uh, in relation to facts, which is... Um, a little bit tricky because I missed it the first time I read the book because I was reading when Carl wrote causal, when he wrote casual, I was reading that as causal because I'd got a whole lot of causals first and then suddenly there's this slight modification of a spelling of a word and I missed it. But it's a quite straightforward, easy one. Um, the ex post facts have got two kinds of causes. Causal facts, which are the enduring necessary ones uh, that are always there, and we've got them via induction. And then there are casual facts, which are occasional interfering uh, accidental things that you cannot get by induction because they're just accidental things. Now, uh, Carl, at this point, gave the analogy of a missile. Today, that's a very inappropriate uh, analogy, so I'm going to change that to... Um, any other technical or logical system, say a robot in a production line, they're moving around, making things, and then suddenly some of the products it's making are going to have small defects included. They're the accidental facts. Maybe some dirt got into the machine or the parts got worn and it wasn't exactly in the right position and so forth. Um, so it's a quite straightforward, easy thing to do uh, to include these casual facts into the story. The third core element is what he calls genetic understanding, and he borrowed this from Ernest Nagel. Um, and what this does, it makes time and history essential. 
you can't leave it out at all because you're explaining things that have causes and that process of the causes creating effects occurs in time or history. So induction involves time. You need time to collect all your observations and so forth before drawing conclusions. Exposed facts have got their genesis in the prior um, ex ante facts, that's to say the effects are caused by the causes that preceded them, and ca casual facts are also located in time. Now, this is the antithesis of Arrow de Brewer theory, where everything is created and done and finished at time zero until the end of uh, time. There is a complete absence of genetic explanation here. It's impossible. It all happens at time zero. Now, I want to draw your attention to some links with, between Carl's sort and Keynes's. He makes few references to Keynes, but there is, they've got similar objectives and methodologies, and there are plenty of entry points for the two. One big difference, which is fixable, concerns uncertainty and probability. It's always explicit in Keynes, but barely there in Carl's thought. But there are many entry points. Um, uncertainty surely is a, an enduring human trait of uh, reality, so it becomes a major ex ante fact uh, in itself. Um, we. Okay, come, come, come. Uh, Carl rejected Laplace's theory of um, determinism, but then Laplace himself went on to develop a theory of probability. Nagel himself links pro uh, genetic explanation to probability, and induction always has a probabilistic element. Uh, and ex ante facts and exposed facts are not identical uh, in Keynes either. So uncertainty, if you bring it into Carl's story, it's compatible with the ex ante facts and the exposed facts and um, you can determine things, you can explain things, and you've got an openness in prediction. There's no uh, definiteness about your prediction coming true. What we've got here is two conflicting methodologies. Um, and now I want to bring everything together. I want to bring together the opening question Carl's framework and the realism-idealism divide. So we've got two, diff uh, two different kinds of methodology. Scientific methodology, focus on the real world. Theorizing begins and ends with the actual and empirical states of the, uh, of the world and its components. And then you've got non-scientific methodology which you in which you focus on worlds known to be imaginary but are seen as lying inside or behind reality. So for the idealist, or the, uh, taking this road, their con theoretical construction is either inside or behind the reality that we observe. So we're going to start with the reality to be understood, which is nature and properties of real humans making exchanges in monetized markets. So this is it. This is the reality we're going to analyze. If you're going to do it the scientific way, you start with that real situation and you keep it as your reference point throughout. You never let go of it. It's the explanandum that is there permanently. You then create realism-based axioms that, and theories out of that. And they will then explain what's going on in the explanandum. The, that's the explanands explaining the explanandum. You will test the concordance between the theory and the reality. And if it's not good, then you adjust your axioms and develop a revised theory until you get a pretty good tool for e explanation. Um, and then you accept, at the same time, all the problems endemic to uh, science. That's to say, which are the best abstractions, corrigibility, theory dependence, uh, value ladenness, the duhem quine thesis, all the problems that beset real science are going to be present here. But it's not just economics, it's all of science. OK, so non-scientific methodology. We're going to replace the 
actual agent with imaginary perfect agents. So this is what we start with. And then in order to develop a theory about this, we're going to substitute for those real people a couple of imaginary agents. Our next step is then to axiomatize the behavior of the imaginary agents in imaginary or perfect situations. So you then get a combination of perfections that allows you to develop a theory of the market or the economy um, with perfect outcomes. So the orthodox structure is understand the imaginary agent in the imaginary environment. That's always there uh, behind or inside observed reality. And then no matter what happens, keep that imagined world as your reference point. If, if you need to make adjustments, don't adjust the imaginary world, make the adjustments elsewhere. You never abandon the imaginary world. So, so this is the strategy. We're going to go from our explanands to the explanandum. We've got three options. If there's no discordance between reality and theory, it, you explain directly with your pure theory. It's either going to be Arrow de Brer or new classical theory if you're an orthodox uh, economist. But if discordance is observed, you don't have uh, a reality, a theory of being able to explain reality very well, you've got further options. So this is our observed discordance. Superman has got beaten up in a boxing match. We have to explain that. This is the imperfect reality that has to be explained. So the first strategy is the real object is an imperfect version of the ideal object it, at which is inside it. And the, the path to take is to go down the road of a neoclassical synthesis. You add in extra bits, some imperfections, to explain this situation. Second strategy is... The imaginary object is still there, but it's just voluntarily changed its appearance or behavior. And this is the approach of the new classical rational expectations story. That if it's observed that um, less work is being done, then it's not because workers have been involuntary un involuntarily unemployed, it's because they have voluntarily chosen not to work as much and to enjoy more leisure. So the perfect story is there. Changes in preferences or exogenous givens are driving the, a new, uh, new observations of the world, a new, new uh, statistical pattern in the world, but really it's perfect. Uh, and the problem is there that the involuntary, the workers declaring they've been involuntarily unemployed are simply mistaken. They have voluntarily chosen to take more leisure. Now, similar opposition happens in um, probability theory between Ramsey, who was the, one of the founders of the subjective theory, and Keynes, the uh, founder of the one, one of the founders of the logical theory. So Ramsey was a mathematician philosopher. His theory is based of probabilities based on no loss betting. Uh, on an infinity of bets between superhuman agents. And the corollary is that probability has nothing whatsoever to do with induction. And it has no basis in reality, of course, because no human being can satisfy its, um, its requirements. Keynes was a logician philosopher uh, and then moved on to economics. His logical theory was based on real humans and their actual reasoning under uncertainty. And this made probability induction uh, quite closely connected. Out of that story, you get different kinds of probability. They can be cardinal, they can be ordinal, they can be known, or they can be unknown. The agent stays rational, but just adopts a different strategy uh, in decision-making, depending on what kind of situation they, they face. 
The system's open, in other words, it's not, not closed. So this brings me back to the opening question. Um, I'm going to make some surmises here. Most people gave a, an ordinal probability. Very few gave it a number. Some said, I don't know. No one used Ramsey's method. Oops, come on. And my conclusion is that everyone is a human. Keynes consistent and Ramsey inconsistent. And Mittermeier consistent as well, because this is a, a realism-based story. <coughs> the main ex-ante facts in Carl's terms you, you have are your general knowledge of human-induced climate change. You've got available data, past and current, and you will have some implicit theory of probability. And out of that, you will be forging your, out of those ex ante facts, you'll be forging your ex post fact, i.e., what is the probability. Um, and it's just a case of real people using reality based reasoning, and wise policy comes out of reality based reasoning. Uh, a very uh, famous saying from the indigenous people in my country is that care for country and ca country will care for you. So Karl was an improver of economics. He was one of that small brave band of pioneers who dared to suggest things the mainstream was not on the right track and that we needed to improve theory and policy uh, from outside the mainstream. And I find his example inspiring, and I think it should inspire all of us. Now, Carl had a delightful sense of humor, which I was able to exploit at my first, um, at the presentation to the first Mittermeier conference. But this book is just dead serious from beginning to end. There's not a skerrick of humor in it. But there's one little known fact that will help us get some uh, humor out of this. You didn't know this, but it's true. And Carl chose a particular song for uh, this dissertation. Not even Isabella knew what it was. And it's from his era. It's 1965. Now, I wanted to play you the, the music without the lyrics, but it wasn't possible here today. So I'm sorry, there's no music for you to recognize. Um, it's there, but when I try and click on that, nothing happens. So Carl took that song, he took the music, but he also improved the lyrics. So the original final verse was this, and this might give you a clue as to what the song was. <laughs> OK, you've got that. Carl changed the words. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I made a mistake. Um, there is 